Why did I buy this camera at the end of 2022? Because it's still amazing or because I needed a new vlogging camera and was able to pick it up from Canon for only $899 last December. But it's so old. Yes, it's old, but let's start this review with how it surprised the industry when it was released over four years ago. The EOS R was Canon's first mirrorless camera released in October 2018 using the letter R from the phrase Reimagine Optical Excellence. It used the same sensor from the Canon 5D Mark IV. The Canon EOS R did set a gold standard for mirrorless cameras with some of the following options. It was the first full-frame mirrorless camera with the fully articulating screen. It had C-Log with 10-bit HDMI output, which was the cheapest external 10-bit option at the time of release, stated by Gordon at Camera Labs. The link to his review is in the description. The mechanical shutter cover remains closed over the sensor when turned off. Why doesn't every camera with a mechanical shutter have this option? It also introduced the RF mount, which enabled some very interesting additional capabilities for the EF lenses, which we'll discuss shortly. Yes, 2018 seems like a long time ago in camera advancements, but I think there are still a few Easter eggs in this camera. I'm not gonna detail every single option as a full review, but I do want to look at the ESR primarily through the eyes of a videographer, even in 2023. There are definitely some limiting factors that we'll eventually get to, but let's discuss the fun features first. The RF mount added the programmable lens ring to perform a number of variable commands on the lens, but it also added the first cool feature that was unexpected for EF lenses, with the most notable being a variable ND filter behind the lens. High-end cinema cameras have built-in variable ND filters like the Sony FX6, and lower-end cinema focused cameras might have filters that can adjust by a stop at a time, like the Blackmagic 6K Pro. Number two, manual focus gamified. It does have focus peaking too, but the manual focus option is what more videographers will use over autofocus since we don't want the camera to have a mind of its own while filming, unless you're at weddings or something. When you engage manual focus, a box with three arrows will appear. You can drag this box wherever you want and then focus until the arrows meet and the box turns green. It's a great way to have full confidence that you're in focus, which can be elusive on such small screens many times, even with focus peaking. Number three, low pass filter. The sensor comes factory with a built-in low pass filter. If you look through the standards of the camera that are typically accepted by Netflix, and I'm definitely not recommending this one, but a low pass filter is very important for video because it removes moray. Moray can ruin footage in post, so this speeds up filming day because you have one less issue to worry about being carried down the workflow into post. Number four, the slide bar. Why does everyone hate this thing so much? I love it. Some people say they accidentally hit the slide bar and activate something they don't want to, but I never do. I personally think that everyone who hates it probably didn't spend enough time with it to see what settings worked. I set it for ISO so I could have the light triangle on the three dials like normal. On the front is aperture, the back dial is shutter speed, and the slide bar is ISO. I think this combination works perfectly to quickly change any settings in manual. Here are some other great features to think about. The HDMI port is not as good as full size, but it is definitely better than the micro type D HDMI port that is found on many newer cameras, including the brand new $2,200 Sony vlogging ZV-E1. It is super easy to transfer images from the camera to a phone wirelessly. Even with today's software standards, just start the app, quickly connect the powered camera with Wi-Fi already turned on, select your images and transfer. It comes with a handy little plastic cable restraint in the box. This is pretty brilliant for those of us trying to use it for video since, since the restraint helps protect the cables and the connectors without purchasing an aftermarket frame to help. The battery grip extension is amazing, but I admit this is mainly used when taking photos, so I'm cheating my premise here a little bit. The grip is built as solid as the camera, so when it's snugged in with the thumb screw, it feels perfect. You can turn the buttons on and off with a switch, and it has the same buttons on the grip extension when rotated. They even considered being able to grab the screen from both sides with this little detent. Brilliant. You can see it charging your batteries. Oh wait, that only works if you have the end battery in both slots. Okay, now onto the issues with some optional workarounds. Number one, no IBIS. Most cinema cameras don't have IBIS either, but it is becoming a new standard to help avoid issues and film with less equipment. 
Here are a few options. Option number one, use lenses with built-in stabilization. Cinema lenses don't have built-in stabilization, so this isn't the best option. Option number two, use a gimbal. Gimbals aren't that expensive and are great ways to get better and more complex shots regardless. Option number three, Use a tripod, jib, or slider for shots. This is similar to using a gimbal. It's just another device to hold the camera for video so you don't freehand the shot unless you want shaky cam. Number two, single card slot. This didn't bug me, but I'm not a professional photographer either. If I was shooting for weddings or professional shoots and wanted the daily reliability to guarantee my shots were saved on at least one card, it would make sense. On the video side, I'm usually shooting external to the Atmos Ninja 5 to get the 10-bit 422 video, so I'm stuck with their unique recording options regardless of this internal limitation. The Atmos can output the same video signal to another recorder if you're worried about the Ninja 5 having recording issues, but I've never had to do that. Number three, the 4K crop is a hefty and unusual 1.75 crop, making it worse than the typical 1.5 crop for APS-C. Option number one, do nothing. Just endure the crop, doing the math with your lenses and move on. If you're using a 50 millimeter, now it's an 87.5 millimeter lens in 4K. Option number two, use a speed booster. Metabones and Canon both made a 0.71 speed booster that drops the crop from 1.75 to 1.24. This gives you a stop of light back and brings the framing well above APS-C size frame to the 1.24 crop, helping your full frame lenses get back some of their life. So if you have a 50 millimeter lens, it would now be a 62 millimeter. I found the Viltrox EF-R3 on eBay for 229 and the Canon EF EOS R.71 for $599, which is not cheap. There are some limitations of which lenses you can use with these speed boosters and more glass can introduce diffraction and other potential issues for video, but it has some big benefits. Option three, use an APS-C lens and let the EOS R automatically reframe 1080 and 4K. The only advantage I see here is that there is less reframing if you bounce between 1080 and 4K. Shooting with the APS-C lenses is generally a cost saving for cinema lenses though, so that's a big plus. And if you're looking for fast lenses like the notoriously great Sigma 18-35 f1.8, then you can still get the same depth of field and lower light, about a stop of light above your full frame counterparts. Number four, external charging limitations. You cannot charge the LPE6N non-N batteries in the camera. Even if you have at least one N battery in the double battery grip, it won't charge the battery. This was a true disappointment. Just let us charge any type of battery in the camera. Number five, the mode dial. I struggle to add this as an issue, but I wanted to talk about it briefly since so many people complained about it. I agree that it's a very weird way of doing things at first, but after getting used to it, I didn't think it was a hindrance at all. And if you look at the R5 or R5C, you'll see that this design didn't go away, but migrated to some of their other cameras. Let's go through a short cinema camera checklist, assuming we are using the Atmos Ninja 5 for video. See how we do. Resolution, 4K minimum. Yep, 4K. Codec, lightly compressed or uncompressed raw or intra-frame all-eye base codec with 422 or greater. Yep, all-eye 422. Bit depth, 10 bit or greater. Yes, 10 bit. Data rate, minimum 240 megabits per second, which is 30 megabytes at 24 frames a second. Yes, we have 57 megabytes per second. Transfer function, scene referred transfer function, S log three, log C, V log, etc. Yes, C log, even though C log two or three is preferred. Time code, check via the Atmos Ninja 5. Variable ND filter behind the lens. Yes, if you're using EF lenses. Low pass filter. Yes, it is built onto the sensor. Dynamic range. Canon says 13.5 stops, but the measured effective stops by Cine D is 10.6. For comparison, red and airy cinema cameras are usually in the range of 15 to 17 stops of light to capture more highlights and darks simultaneously, while digital cameras are still mostly around 10 to 14. So I would score this low for dynamic range for digital cameras today. If you felt like you were reading something familiar for this list, it's because I was kind of cheating using Netflix standards for the first group of items. 
Netflix isn't the final authority for all things cinema, but I believe they still have a healthy requirements list because they're trying to keep all of their production teams working congruently to a delivery standard. And finally, since this review is being completed in 2023, let's see how the EOS R compares to other full frame cameras being sold by Canon today. These seem to be some of the more important items to compare for value. The EOS R and RP can be purchased for a little cheaper on Canon's website for refurbished versions, so you might want to check there for updated prices. All of the cameras have low pass filters, which honestly surprised me. The megapixel count is all over the place, but this is where you notice that the R6 Mark II and the R8 have the same sensor, which is true, which is a massive value for the R8 because of the next line, which shows that there is no crop in 4K for the R8. The R is the only one that requires an external recorder to use 10-bit log profile. All of the cameras use dual pixel autofocus in 4K except for the RP. The EVF is the nicest in the R6 Mark II, and the R6 camera is the only two with IBIS as well as the only cameras with two SD card slots. And finally, the R6 Mark II is the only camera with 6K raw output from HDMI. Definitely use this chart to help decide what is important to you, but I think the R8 is a ridiculous value for the money. The R6 Mark II is worth the extra thousand to get the extra options like IBIS, 6K RAW, better EVF, and two SD card slots. But this is where I shift to the Lumix S5 Mark IIx instead for the money. Who is this camera for today? I think it is an absolute perfect vlogging camera or YouTube camera, which is why I purchased it. The autofocus is amazing and you don't need to film in 4K for most YouTube materials since they're gonna compress the quality quite a bit anyways. So filming in full frame 1080 is perfectly acceptable. Maybe even just upsample in DaVinci on export if you need the extra resolution. The ESR is also a truly professional photography camera with its weather sealed 30 megapixel sensor. So for the photo world, other than only having one card slot, it's one of my absolute favorites to shoot. But for videography, it's a half glass empty kind of situation, sadly. No internal 10 bit and no IBIS, even though it has a few rich video features like an adjustable ND for EF lenses, a low pass filter built in for sensor to avoid moray and C log for a little, just a little extra dynamic range, even though the dynamic range is still on the low end. When paired with an Atmos Ninja 5, you can finally record 10-bit 422 and C-Log, but most cameras can film 10-bit internal now, so you don't have to rely on so much extra gear to get the same quality. Most times I film short films, I use an external monitor regardless, so maybe this isn't a huge negative, other than the cost of a cheap $200 monitor versus the Ninja 5 for 500 bucks. This is where the R8 and the R6 Mark II sensor and processor with no crop in 4K would definitely be a better choice for the money, unless you can find a used ESR for around a thousand bucks or so. The ESR feels and operates like a superior high quality camera. I absolutely love the way it sounds in taking photos and the touch screen works great too. But in the end, this is an amazing camera with some unique features, but will finally have to go in order to make room for my S5 Mark II X coming this month or next month, or whenever they decide to finally ship the camera. It was scheduled for May 31st, but who knows. Do any of you have the Canon EOS R? What did you think about the camera? Is there anything I mentioned that you disagree with? Please let me know in the comments. And if you like the review, please be sure to click the like button and subscribe to the channel to keep getting more videos like this. Time to get back to filming.